Hey everyone, this is Amber Key, and you're listening to a Bright Idea podcast, a show where I sit down with entrepreneurs to discuss the aha moments that launch their businesses. We're back for another episode, and today we're joined by author, clothing designer, law student, and I have a feeling that isn't it, Chantelle Song Bembry. Chantelle is in her third year at Temple University and an incoming attorney. As a proud alumna of the illustrious Hampton University, she holds a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism with a minor in Leadership Studies. Chantelle is the author of the middle grade novel Desiree Davenport, Welcome to Treeless Park, which uses football and cheerleading to tackle bullying. Prior to attending law school and publishing Desiree Davenport, Chantelle wrote and illustrated the Honey Bunch Kids book series. Her contributions to literacy have been recognized by notable media outlets including Black Enterprise, Essence Magazine, ESPN's The Undefeated, and BET. In 2015, Chantel was recognized at the Black Girls Rock Award Show, where the former First Lady Michelle Obama declared her a Making a Difference girl. In May 2018, Chantel was featured in LeBron James' Always Believe campaign during the NBA playoffs. In this episode, Chantelle and I discuss the process of writing a novel, self-publishing, and how to overcome people stealing your ideas. I was always a very creative person. I loved cartoons back then, and I still do. And my favorite network was Nickelodeon, and I loved Rugrats, Hey Arnold, Jimmy Neutron, pretty much all those shows. And... I love to laugh. I'm always thinking of ways to make myself laugh or make other people around me laugh. And my mom inspired me to start writing because I was an only child, I still am. So she wanted me to have a hobby to keep me busy and not be you know, lonely all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how I got into writing um, from the age of nine. My fourth grade teacher would always comment about how she loved to read my work. So I guess from age nine, I really got into writing and being creative. Do you remember the first story that you wrote? Yes. The first story I wrote was about a girl and her older sister. And the girl was like a child and her older sister was a teenager. And she saw some gum on her sister's dresser and her sister was like, don't touch this candy. And then she didn't listen and then ate all the gum and then threw up in the bedroom. (laughs) So I think that was the first story I wrote. Um, I don't know where those drawings are, but it's, it's up here somewhere, but that was, (laughs) I love that. So you had mentioned that you are the author of the Honey Bunch Kids. Um, Can Mm -hmm. you, for our listeners, can you take us through what the Honey Bunch Kids series is about? Yes, the Honey Bunch Kids is a series about middle school and having fun and just being a kid, a lighthearted story that's very similar to, I would say, Hey Arnold, Um, it's about a group of kids who meet on the first day of sixth grade. They all miss the bus and none of their parents show them any love because they send them to walk to school in the rain. Like, who does that? I'm not sure why I wrote that, but that's what happens. They meet up on the first day of school and they've got this really mean teacher and her name is Miss Hodgebottom. And there's a bully in the class and all these kids. And it's just learning how to get along with people and experiencing the fun antics that you do when you're in middle school. So that's a bit, pretty much the gist of the series. And when yeah. did you when did you begin that series? I began that series when I was 10 years old. I created the first character and his name was Cheeks. And at first I was gonna make him the bully, but then I added two other characters, a girl named Dizzy and another boy named Stuart. And I decided, okay, let's not make Cheeks the bully. Let's make them all friends. So it was age 10 when I I started it. When you were coming up with the concept for the book and then you published the book, were your intentions to create, to continue uh, like a child's, a children's book series, or did you want it to turn it into like a television show or like what, what were some of your goals with your series? Yeah, my mom is the one who inspired me to get the story out there because I created the concept when I was 10, but it wasn't until I was 13 when the book was published. And back then I was like, I can't do this. I'm a child. And my mom was like, no, there's a space for a story like this one, specifically a story that shows African-American kids having fun in a lighthearted scenario. So she was the one who pushed me to do it. 
And when I published the book, my main intention was to have it be a cartoon on television because I was a kid and I loved to watch TV. I love to read too, but my mother is the one who was like, you know, kids need to uh, be inspired to love literacy and you can help them do this through your book. And so when your book was published and it was out there, you know, how did you get eyeballs? How did you get people to to read and spread the word about your book? Yeah. Yeah, I remember it was an interesting process and I was 13, so it was over 10 years ago. Um, I remember going to a conference called the Black Enterprise Youth Entrepreneurs Conference, and that was down in Atlanta, Georgia. And I went down with my book. My mom was with me. And that's how I got a lot of exposure. My first article was published on blackenterprise.com, and it was called a uh, 13 year old publishes her own book or something. And at the time, a lot of kids weren't doing that, but today a lot of kids are doing it. So that's great. Um, but Black Enterprise was the first. And then from there, other news outlets started to pick up the story as I continued to get older. Let's face it, starting a business is hard work and building a website for a business that's another story. Why not hire some help? 35th Street Builders are not just website builders. They're dreamers. With experience spanning in startups to enterprises, 35th Street Builders will provide you with the mobile app and web development skills to get your business up and running. At 35th Street Builders, they pride themselves on affordability, reliability, and compassion. Ready to take some work off your plate? You can schedule an intro call with 35th Street Builders by going to their website at 3sb.io. That's the number three, the letter S, the letter B, dot I-O. So, yeah, like I want to kind of jump into that as you continue to get older and talk about your latest book, um, Desiree Davenport, Welcome to Treeless Park and what the inspiration was behind that book. Um, and, you know, going from the Honey Bunch Kids, which is both are young people series, the Honey Bunch Kids and uh, Desiree Davenport. However, Desiree Davenport is a, is a little older. Would you say it's more like teenage, um, like high school reading? Yeah, I would say the Honey Bunch Kids is good for like a third grade level. And then Desiree Davenport, the characters are 12, but anyone from age 11 to 14 can enjoy the book. Where did you get the inspiration behind that book? Yeah, Desiree Davenport came out of the Honey Bunch Kids, actually. I was, at the time, working with a literary agent to pitch the Honey Bunch Kids as a graphic novel series to all the publishing houses, uh, Scholastic and whoever else. Uh, but no one wanted it. So my literary agent suggested that I rework the Honey Bunch Kids into another type of story to hopefully get picked up um, by a publisher there. And that's how Desiree Davenport came about. So Desiree is the same pretty much as the Desiree and the Honey Bunch kids. Chauncey, whose cheeks is also in the story. And I can tell you what the book is about. It's about um, anti-bullying as it pertains to youth football and cheerleading. And I used a lot of my own experiences to write that slightly older story. It's a novel. So I really like it. Yeah, I love that. I I love um, that you're exploring these themes that you have experienced in your own life and um, using that um, in in your writing for these books um, to help inspire other kids who are going through the same thing, but also to promote literacy. Uh, talk to me, though, for people who are not authors, who are not writers, um, you know, there are, I, you and I spoke about this prior to this interview about there's like, I think the top five, like publishing houses. Um, and you had spoken with them in trying to promote this book. Can you walk us through who those publishing houses are and sort of, um, for those who don't know, you self-published this book, which is mm -hmm quite a different experience than pitching it to a publishing house and then getting them to promote your book. Um, mm -hmm. Talk to me, to me a little bit about those publishing houses and like sort of what was the experience and what was the decision that you made behind publishing your own book? Right. 
Yeah, that is a great question, Amber. Um, you're right, Desiree Davenport is self-published, um, as is the Honey Bunch Kids. But for those who don't know, if you want to write a book, you can take two paths. One is traditional publishing, which is through a publishing house, and the other is self-publishing, which is on your own. And to be traditionally published, you have to team up with a literary agent who pretty much negotiates a deal between you and the publisher. But before you can get to the publisher, you have to hop through all these hurdles pretty much. And these hurdles are called editors. So the agent will pitch your manuscript to an editor at a Scholastic or a HarperCollins. And the editor will read maybe a piece of it and say, yeah, I, I, I like this. I'm going to send this up, you know, the ladder. Um, or they'll say, ah, this is not the right fit. And they'll just, you know, reject it altogether. So in my case, we pitched Desiree Davenport to the big five, Scholastic, HarperCollins, FSG, Simon & Schuster, um, I think Penguin Random House is part of that big five as well, um, or Macmillan, one of those. But we pitched to all of those people. And the feedback was very interesting. I was told that my writing was too sharp, meaning that the lessons that I wanted the kids to gain were too on the nose. They were too obvious. And in my mind, I said to myself, well, other authors who are much older than I am are allowed to be sharp, but I'm not. So that's kind of strange. I was also told that my writing does not jump off the page and that another editor couldn't get through it. So I pretty much saw a pattern happening where all of these publishers were seeing this story, which is about Black kids in an inner city experiencing family and being in school. And it seemed like the publishers just didn't want to publish this story mm -hmm. because I don't have any cops in my story. I don't have any guns. I don't have any drugs. I don't have any dad getting arrested or maybe the mom dies on the first page. So my book was very lighthearted and the publishers didn't want it. Not from me anyway. So after several years of trying, I said, I'm wasting time. And I stepped away from my agent and I decided to publish Desiree Davenport on my own. So when you were going through sort of the editing process and you were hearing from, let's say, the first two publishing houses um, just about you know, the sharpness or can't not being able to get through it, did you take any of those critiques and go back and rewrite or edit edit what they were trying to get you to change? Yeah, at first the edits were reasonable. I was told at first to make my writing more developed. And I said, okay, great. And one of the publishers sent me a couple copies of books that they did publish and said, you know, read some of these and get an idea of what it means to have a developed story. And I said, okay. And I wrote a more developed story and it was 10 times better than what I sent before. But even then they still said no. And I was like, okay, I guess you guys just don't want me telling this type of story. So, you know, and I was very upset because when you are traditionally published, you have access to movie houses who might want to adapt a book into a film. And, you know, I had all these visions of who I wanted to play the main character, Desiree and her mom. And when I stepped away, I was like crushed pretty much, but it worked out in the end because the changes that they wanted me to make after I made the story 10 times better, I don't think I would have liked them. So I am glad that I stepped away. Who did they want you to be as an author? Like what, what, what was going to be something that was sellable, I guess, in their eyes? That is a great question. I think they wanted me to be someone like the author of The Hate You Give. And I did read The Hate You Give, but I remember that the book was challenged by parents because it had a lot of bad words in it. Um, I don't remember the exact word or how many pages it was on, but I remember parents complaining that, you know, this word appears in the book how many ever times. And also the title of the book, The Hate You Give, before you even open the book, you're met with an image of a Black girl holding up a poster that says hate. Mm -hmm. So I think they wanted me to kind of buy in to this sellable story of Black hate. And that just wasn't me and it wasn't my story. So that's what I think. Yeah. And I think like with your book, you know, you are touching on some pretty serious themes in terms of bullying and just going through adolescence, which 
in and of itself could be like if they're if they want you to show you know some sort of like hardship among mm -hmm. people i mean you're doing that already with the themes but um i think that one of the points that you touched on earlier was that you have like black children in these in your book who are experiencing joy who do have families in their homes and um i think that it is very unfortunate that that was critiqued or that was told to be altered um rather than allowing you to speak your truth within your own book right because <laughs> you're the author um yeah. so when you self-publish like take me through like how does that even work how do you self-publish a book yeah first it's much more freedom than you're going back and forth with an editor and my agent loved the story that I wrote but we just couldn't get the publishers to buy into it so stepped away there but once I was away I was like okay I can do whatever I want so if you are an author or you know an author who wants to get their work out there it's the world is your oyster with your book it is harder to promote it I used um, an editing company called word to kindle to copy edit the text and to check for like type errors or spelling and I used Amazon KDP so when I published my book it was 2020 and hardcover wasn't an option, just soft cover. But now Amazon KDP has both hard and soft cover. And it's completely free to use Amazon's platform to publish your book. All you have to do is upload your file and upload your cover art and your back cover art. And I hired an artist. His name is Aaron Fisher. And he's the one who did the artwork for the book. And he I, did a great job. So with self-promotion um, yeah. or self-publishing, like shout out to you for not giving up and still wanting to put your story out there. But I could imagine that self-promoting your book is a challenge because it is all on you. So, you know, all, other than I know that for the listeners that are listening to this, her story or your book is available on Amazon. People can purchase it on Amazon. Um, but how else were you promoting your book? Basically with social media, I found social media is pretty much the only way now to really get your book out there. Um, if you have a large following on Instagram, which I do not, <laughs> so that makes it harder. But if you do, having a social media following helps and also paying for Amazon ads. So when you publish a book on Amazon, you can engage in some kind of marketing where you pay like per click and your book can show up next to other books that are kind of like it. And I did get some sales off that, but otherwise just reaching out to schools, um, principals and teachers and saying, hey, put the book in the classroom if you'd like. And that's how the word is spread, just little by little what you can do. I want to pivot a little bit into um, writing process, uh, because when I interview people on a bright idea there's people from all different industries and I love to give the background on who you are and like your uh your business but I also want people who are aspiring to become authors and write their own books um mm -hmm. to get a sort of education because it's not an easy thing to do so what can you give some insights into your writing process? And then do you have any like specific rituals or routines that help with your creative process? Yeah, I think the writing process, you have to start by knowing who you're writing for. Um, because if you know who you're writing for, then that'll help you figure out how technical to make your writing. So for me, I was writing for middle school or high school. So I don't want to make you know it too complicated. But if you're writing for an older audience, keep that in mind, too. And then know your characters. Um, base them off people who you know so that they feel real. And that's what you call a developed character, not one that's just like, this character is mean. And that's all he ever is, is mean. Like, no, this character is mean, but sometimes he's nice. Or maybe he's mean because he had this tragic backstory. And if that didn't happen, he wouldn't be so mean. So making your characters feel like real people with not multiple personality disorder, but like different aspects to their personality. Um, and then when you know your characters, start writing from where you know exactly what happens in the book or in the story. Some people say, oh, you know, I don't know what happens in the first chapter. Okay, well, write what happens in chapter five and then have that there and go back. And 
jump around to where you want to tell the story. It's yours. So that's what I, I would say. That's really interesting. Um, as someone who's never written a book, so I I would think that you would write it chronologically. But what you're saying is that if you can't think of a, of something in that specific chapter, jump ahead to maybe like what happens after this character is developed, and like maybe yeah. work your way backwards. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. I love that. Um, how did you decide which genre you wanted to write? Yeah, I've always loved the realistic fiction genre. So that's the type of genre that my books are. I've always loved stories about school. My favorite show on Nickelodeon is probably All Grown Up, which is a spinoff of Rugrats. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, people hate on that show for some reason, but I just like seeing shows about regular people doing regular things and books about regular people. So yeah. I knew that if if I could relate to the story, then I would enjoy writing it. So that's how I decided on realistic fiction as a genre. I think also to, to add to your point of all grown up, um, I loved that show too because I loved the character development. Like I loved like in the Rugrats, you know, these are babies and they have like, they can only do but so much. And then we see in Rugrats all grow up how they've all grown up how they like developed into their characters and how even though so many things have changed they're still the same people right so yeah. I love that I, I think that I'm so glad you used that as an example I forgot about that show That's are it. there any authors or books that have made like a significant impact on your writing style yeah great question Amber I would say I always grew up reading Judy Bloom books um, I read the Super Fudge books. I think Judy Bloom wrote those books. Um, the Ramona series. I any author who wrote books about kids being regular kids, that's who I flocked to. I also liked um Virginia Hamilton. She wrote a book called Bluish, also about um kids in school. Those were um black kids, I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, any any authors who wrote about school, I loved it. So for aspiring authors listening to this podcast, what would you give that, what advice would you give them as they embark on their writing journey? Yeah, I would say that if you want to write, I would say put your work out there. I think a lot of times people are afraid to put something out there because they're afraid that people won't like it or they're afraid that they'll write mean things about it because the internet is crazy. And it seems like people who try to create things, there's always someone who tries to, you know, say, oh, this isn't good. But you just have to remember that there are things out there that are half as good as what you think yours is. Mm. And it's and people like it because it's there. And I have to remind myself of that as well. You know, the shows that we grew up watching and the books that we grew up reading, not all of them were good, but we liked them because they were on all the time. So if you want to tell a story, put it out there and somebody will like it. I guarantee you somebody will like it. What are some lessons that you learned along the way that you wish someone had shared with you when you were starting out? I wish that someone would have told me a little bit more about the traditional publishing process because it's very easy to walk into a bookstore and see books on the shelves and say, wow, you know, I'm going to get my book on the shelf one day. And you definitely can, but you also have to know what that might cost you. It might cost you your story. And there's a quote, I don't know who said it, but it says, you don't get the book you wanted, you get the book you got. So when you're going through that, you know, traditional publishing hurdle, you might start with, this is my story. And then when you get it on the shelf, it's like, oh, this is my story. Okay. <laughs> So I just wish I would have known a little bit more about that. And maybe I would have um, embraced the self-publishing process a lot sooner with the Desiree Davenport book. I want to also mention that um, authors are entrepreneurs. And oftentimes when people think about entrepreneurship, they think that you have this one lane, this one business, and that's it. And that's your focus. But you, um, you know, we're talking about your book right now, but you've also been an entrepreneur in other areas. Um, and I want to get into that a little bit. So uh, a few years ago, you started a clothing line or you designed um 
a line of clothing um, that you promoted. And I remember seeing you promoting it on social media. Um, and in our discussions, I think prior to this interview, you told me that you um, had found that well-known brands all of a sudden had the same design. And so I really love that we're having this conversation today because I feel that even as an author, your ideas can be stolen or you can see your well thought out planned ideas that you may have pitched to somebody and they didn't want it all of a sudden end up somewhere else. So can you give a little bit of background about your clothing line that you created um, and tell us what happened? Yes. Um, great question, Amber. So in 2020, when everyone was stuck at home with you know COVID, I launched a clothing line featuring my original designs. I don't sew, but I did the artwork and put the artwork on what they call custom print clothes. So it's like blank white clothing, a dress, a shirt, a sock, and you, you paste your art onto it and it becomes like a beautiful design. And the inspiration for these designs came out of the Desiree Davenport book where the characters go to a clothing store and one of the characters sees a swirly dress in the window and she wants it. And after I wrote the book, I'm reading it and I'm like, oh, the swirly dresses. So in my mind, I thought, well, maybe I can create a dress that looks something like how I thought of it in the book. And that's where this swirl concept came from and putting them on dresses. So that's that's how that happened. And I reached out to a contact that I had made at Target. And I met this contact when I was on Black Girls Rock in 2015. And at the time, she wanted to put the Honey Bunch kids in Target, but that didn't happen because the books weren't formatted properly. So I said, hey, I got these dresses now. Maybe this will be cool. And she said, oh, yeah, thanks. And I didn't hear anything back from her about the dresses. But, you know, months later, I'm browsing online and I see that my designs are now in Target. And although they're not the exact design, it's the concept, the swirl. And they even had a page on their website called Swirl. And I said, hey, wait a minute, I emailed you my designs and now all of a sudden you have Swirl on the Target website? They took that page down after I sent that email. And I went back and forth and I said, you guys have pretty much stolen what I've created. And this one lady in the legal department was like, oh, it's a swirly trend happening across the marketplace. And I said, no, that swirly trend is mine. And I know that it's mine because before going to Target, I was on Instagram advertising and I got all of these hate messages on my posts. These dresses are ugly. You're so ugly in them. What are you doing? Why are you posing like that? And the bullying really got to me. So I stopped promoting on Instagram. Wow. I came up Instagram for a while. And then next thing you know, you see the entire fashion industry from Macy's, Forever 21, they're all doing swirl. And it's not just clothes. Sometimes I see it on tissue boxes or eyeshadow palettes in Ulta. So I'm just like, you know what, <laughs> whatever. So it, it's devastating. Um, I was really upset about it. Now I see it and I look the other way and I try not to get sad, but that's what happened. So first of all, I'm so so sorry that that happened to you and actually listening to you explain that gave me chills um because I would be just as upset and I have definitely not to the scale of Target which is an internationally well-known brand um but I've definitely had ideas that were well thought out that I've seen somewhere else and it infuriates me um, mm -hmm. So I couldn't even imagine going through that. So from that experience, like, did that hold you back from pursuing other entrepreneurial adventures and adventures, excuse me. And did that, was that kind of the reason that you decided to go back to school, specifically law school? Yeah. So that definitely had a huge impact on how I felt about pursuing business and just creating in general. That's not the reason why I went back to law school. But it is a reason why, and I've had this conversation with my mom many times, it's a reason why I've said I don't want to create anything else anymore. Um, besides, the, besides the swirl, I do have other designs that they didn't steal. 
but I don't want to sell anything with those designs because even if I don't post them online, I'm afraid that someone will maybe buy it and wear it and then take a photo of it, post it, and then someone will come on and say, oh, look at this, and then they'll just steal it. So I'm very afraid to create any more designs and put them on clothes now. Um, law school, you mentioned, is interesting. I did take intellectual property, and I learned that no one in the world can own a concept of anything. Mm. So legally, they haven't stolen from me because they didn't copy my exact swirl. They have swirled, but they've done other colors or their swirl bends over here and mine bends over there. Hmm. That's that's the law. So if you said, Amber, that you wanted to write a story about a girl and her dog, you don't own that concept, but you own your interpretation of the girl and her dog or you own the interpretation of the swirl. So that's that's what it is. I hate to hear that it deterred you from wanting to create something new because someone would take the idea because I feel like you're such a creative person and people do your designs do deserve to be out in the world and you should be making money off of it like that's just my opinion I do however understand that that is the law that like you can create you can have some idea but um it's not necessarily your own but there are other rules and regulations. Like how can you protect yourself? Like, can you trademark an idea? Can you patent it? I am, I'm not very well versed in that, those areas, but I'm hoping that you may know. <laughs> yeah, you're asking great questions. And these are questions that everyday people need to know because people have ideas. Um, you can only patent an invention and you can only trademark a logo or a slogan. Art is crazy because if I see a drawing of a purple flower and I say, hmm, maybe I'll draw a purple flower, but my flower will have spiky petals instead of round. And all of a sudden I'm selling millions of purple flowers, but you were the one who created purple flowers first. Art is crazy. So that's just the way it is. People who have inventions are a little bit more protected because their invention does a certain thing. But even then, someone can come along and revamp what you've already created and say, oh, my robot doesn't just mop the floor. Mine can wash the dishes. And now I've got this robot. Like, really? But that's the law. So how can people protect themselves from people taking their ideas? You'll have to get a lawyer and you'll have to find some good evidence that, you know, a company stole an exact replica of what you designed. There's a story of a lady who came out with a line of t-shirts with an American flag on it and Target stole that from her. And she was able to succeed because it was the exact same American flag, like the same. So she was able to succeed because the design was simple. It's a flag, but mine would be much harder because they would be able to say, well, we didn't do black and white. You, why don't you sell black and white and we'll sell, you know, all the other colors? Well, no, that's not fair because you're a billion dollar company who has marketing budgets coming out of your ears mm -hmm. and I don't. And people are going to buy from you first before they buy from me. So I would say if you're going to create something, make sure you have some legal representation available just in case someone steals it. But you know what? The, the big stores steal from each other too. I've seen things on Forever 21's website that I've seen in Macy's or on Macy's.com. So it's not just the small people, it's the big ones too. Yeah. And I think, and Shein, especially, I think a lot of the um, fast fashion brands are all stealing from each other and taking ideas and just like soft launching them to see how they'll do in the market. And then once they find out that people are into the trend, then they, they start generating them in bulk. But yeah, I, I do agree. I think that, um, it's really hard to be original these days. Mm -hmm. Everyone is just re recreating and revamping old ideas. I mean, mm -hmm. we see it all the time in the movie industry. I mean, why do we need so many versions of the same movie? But that's a topic for another day. <laughs> what is, what's next for you? Yeah, so I've done some fun things with entrepreneurship. I am going to graduate from law school. 
I'm going to start at the construction firm in Philly. And I'm also in the process of revamping the Honey Bunch Kids for YouTube in the small way that I can. I am not an animator, but I do have my art and I do voices. So I'm going to try and come up with something creative that maybe can earn me some, some money on YouTube and make the YouTube kids or the kids who watch YouTube smile a little bit. So I would say that's what's next. I love that. And I love that even though um, you taught, you touched on some tough topics in this conversation, I'm happy that you're not letting it dull your sparkle because the world deserves to see the Honey Bunch Kids on YouTube. Thank, thank you, Amber. Yeah. And if you ever need a voice for any of the characters, you just hit me up. <laughs> Absolutely. Because to be honest, anyone who does radio and TV we can all do voices. So yes. No, I would love to. That would be a dream come true. Where can people find you? They can find me on Instagram. See, my Instagram name is spelled a little bit different from my legal spelling. But on Instagram, I go by Chantal underscore so underscore chic. Chantal so chic on Instagram. Um, and I started this new page because too much cyberbullying. I, I was on TikTok, but TikTok people are crazy too. So that's done. So just on Instagram, or you can find me in person if we happen to cross paths. Awesome. Before I let you go, I want to play a rapid fire game with you, if you would allow me. Yes. Okay. Um, if you could have dinner with any three fictional characters from different books, who would they be and why? different fictional characters from different books. I think I'll have dinner with Junie B. Jones because I need to find out like what what was going on with her. Like I read so many of her books and she was always like a menace to her parents. To society. So she was a menace to society. <laughs> yeah, like what was up with you, Junie B? So I'm let's let's have dinner with her. Um who else would I have dinner with? Um I'll have dinner with the wimpy kid from Diary of a Wimpy Kid because I got to find out, like, have you have you toughened up any since book one? Like, it's been 14 books and you're still wimpy. Like, you need a therapist. So let's have <laughs> let's have dinner with wimpy kid. And then lastly, I'll I'll have dinner with the Honey Bunch kids. I'll have dinner with the Honey Bunch kids because they would have a lot to say and I'd have I, I would have fun with them. And they can toughen wimpy kid up. Absolutely, because come on, get it, get it together. <laughs> this is funnier than I thought it was going to be. Okay, do you have any unusual writing habits or rituals that you find essential to your creative process? Yes, I would say when I'm writing something, I'll probably like read the dialogue out loud in the character's voice to find out if the dialogue fits. Mm -hmm. So if I write something and it's like, Oh, come on, man. Why'd you have to do that? I would say it in the character's voice, like, oh, come on, man. Why'd you have to do that? And then I would totally. say, okay, yeah, that's that's something he would say. So I would say, I, I do that. I love that. And I feel like that's so smart, like getting into character, because I feel like it's sort of like acting, right? Like you have to like put yourself into that character to help with the development, to help with like how the reader is going to interpret it. Like, I, I think that's so smart. Thanks. <laughs> um, if you were to write, okay, hold on. If you were to write in a genre completely different from your current work, which genre would it be? And what kind of story would you want to explore? Yeah, I would have two genres. I would have like science fiction because I enjoy reading science fiction and like, you know, reading about like future or dystopias mm -hmm. or, you know, robots taking over the world, stuff like that. And also like romance novels. I've never like read a romance novel before, but I know they're like a hot thing. So <laughs> one of the other two. They are. They, they yeah, they're a hot thing. People do love their romance novels. Um, mm. If you could switch lives with any book character, who would it be? And what adventure would you embark on? This is a great question. You know what? Let me like think back. <laughs> yeah, take your time. I, I guess the book character 
should be within the genre that I write for, right? Like a realistic fiction. It could be anything, anything you've ever read that you want to switch lives for a day. Okay. Um, I guess I would switch lives with uh, Ramona Quimby because she had an older sister named Beezes. That was her name, was Beezes. And I don't know, having an older sister seems cool. You seem like a cool older sister to Kayla, so. I am um, pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, wait, I do remember that story. Dang, you are like really throw, like the throwbacks tonight are on are another they level. They're hitting. I'm like, whoa, I just want to like go back to like fifth grade scholastic book fair days. Yeah. I love that. And that's why you have to continue with the Honey Bunch Kids, please. Thank you. I will do my best. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on to the show today. This has been a really awesome show. And I think that so many people are going to learn so many lessons from you. Thank you so much for having me, Amber. I enjoyed being on your show. And again, um, I'm just so proud of you for creating this platform. And I can't wait to see what episodes you come out with next. Thank you, Chantel. That's it for this week's episode of A Bright Idea Podcast. Today's guest was Chantel Song Bembry, author of Desiree Davenport, Welcome to Treeless Park, and the Honey Bunch Kids series. You can support Chantel by purchasing her books on Amazon and subscribing to the Honey Bunch Kids series on YouTube. If you liked today's episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to my podcast and leave a review. Shout out to my amazing editor, Chris, for all of the edits each and every week. If you have a bright idea or a topic you think I should cover on the show, hit me up on social media or email me at jacksonstreetmediaco.com. Until next week, I'm Amber Key.